thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Um, I hope to be able to talk about the kind of background to a CLL diagnosis and, and the basics of assessing someone who presents with CLL for the first time. And some of the ways in which we as um, CLL doctors can help our patients to stay well and, and live well with their CLL. So obviously some of this is known to you already. It, CLL is a, a cancer of a mature B cell and it leads to progressive accumulation of, of pretty non-functional monoclonal B cells within lymph nodes and within the blood and bone marrow. Um, some patients have CLL that just involves their blood and bone marrow. Um, most patients have CLL that's in their blood and bone marrow and have a bit of lymphadenopathy as well. And more rarely patients have CLL, which is, is just within the nodes and no detectable disease in the marrow. Um, and those patients are labeled as having small lymphocytic leukemia, but the biologically and genetically, the disease is identical. CLL is the most common leukemia in the Western world and is um, increasing in prevalence, both due to earlier diagnosis of patients through their GPs and, and more people having routine blood tests, and also because our treatments are getting better. So patients are living for much longer with the disease, meaning that the, um, the overall um, kind of burden of care for these patients is increasing over time. And the instance is said to be between sort of four and six per 100,000 patients per year. It's commoner in men and um, there's big ethnic variation. So um, commonest in kind of the, in Europe and America and much rarer in um, Asian and African populations. As we all know, um, the instance of CLL um, increases uh, dramatically. So it's a disease that as doctors, we usually look after people in uh, 70s and 80s. And I think the average age at, at presentation is kind of late 60s, early 70s. But um, I'm sure we all also care for patients who um, are diagnosed with CLL at a much younger age and for whom the consequences of that diagnosis and the time that they would like to live with their CLL is much greater. There is um, a significant family association with CLL, not just with the CLL disease itself, but if we look at relatives uh, of patients who've been diagnosed um, with CLL, we can see that um, I'll just move that out of the way. Um, we can see that in many patients, we can detect um, what we call a monoclonal B-cell lymphocytosis. And that's where we can see a, a low level of monoclonal B-cells within the peripheral blood that have the same features as CLL, but no um, other, nothing to suggest that it's causing a problem or causing um, a, a cancerous condition. So that's... Um, no, uh, no swollen glands, no anemias, no changes in the blood count. Um, and when we look at sort of populations of older patients, um, that's present in up to one in 10 of us. Uh, and we don't know exactly what, why that happens, um, but it's thought to be um, multifactorial. Um, perhaps due to the, the stimuli that our B cells receive over time, um, changes in the environment where they live within the bone marrow, um, acquired genetic changes over time and sort of modulation of chromatin uh, as well. The natural history of MBL is that about one to 2% of patients per year progress to Avert CLL, and we know that 
features that predict for um, more aggressive CLL disease also predict for a higher risk of progression from MBL to CLL if they're seen in that early phase of the disease. The International uh, Working Group for CLL defines the disease as the presence of more than five um, clonal B lymphocytes in the peripheral blood. And we confirm um, lighting restriction and clonality using a flow cytometer. And characteristically, we look for um, the classic immunophenotype. Um, and uh, Europe-wide now, the, uh, the agreed markers that all patients should have are um, that the B cells are CD5 and 19 positive. Characteristically, they, they express CD20 at a much lower level than other B cells um, and express CD23 in combination with CD5 and either a low level of either kappa or lambda immunoglobulin on the cell surface, defining the clonality and identical nature of the cells. Some cases are more difficult and um, other um, antigens that can be helpful to differentiate are listed below. And I think in practice, probably CD200 and ROR1 are the ones that I would most commonly use in clinical practice to help. I think Ben will talk about all of this in more detail in his talk. Um, CLL is, is um, clinically one disease in terms of presentation, um, but genetically is very clearly uh, split into two distinct types of cell, which then go on to behave in quite distinct fashions during CLL progression and particularly following CLL treatment. So during B-cell maturation, um, in the immunoglobulin, there is uh, normally recombination between the B, D and, and J segments, the variable diversity and junctional segments. And then furthermore, when normal B cells are exposed to antigen, um, that variable region undergoes somatic hypermutation within the germinal center. And we can see two populations of CLL cells. Each patient will have one or the other. Um, one group will have a more immature, unmutated immunoglobulin. And um, I've put this the wrong way around, actually, I've just realized. So please ignore the, um, the slides, that's an error. So the mutated immunoglobulin is the more mature cells, which have a post-germinal sensor immunophenotype. And the unmutated cells have a pre-germinal sensor immunophenotype and, and behave more aggressively. All CLL cells show evidence of reduced apoptosis, increased proliferation, abnormal antibody res responses, and um, stereotypy of the B cell receptor. Ben, I know, will talk about the characteristic chromosomal mutations and genetic changes, deletions, and duplications that we see in CLL. And we also know, as I mentioned before, that the microenvironment and um, intracellular pathways are affected by these mutations and important for disease progression. CLL is often picked up incidentally. Um, patients have a routine blood test for another reason and are found to have a lymphocytosis. Some patients present with lymphadenopathy directly, and I've seen quite a few patients who've had CLL found in a biopsy done for another reason. So CLL crops up in lots of different tissues. So uh, for instance, patients who've had an axillary node clearance for breast cancer can sometimes have CLL detected. Um, 
probably more rarely patients present with, with B symptoms because it's usually quite an indolent disease. And today, anyone having recurrent infections will usually have had um, a blood count as part of that workup and the CLL will become apparent. Um, and occasionally, especially young patients, can present with um, autoimmune complications of the disease as their first uh, flag of a problem. Diagnosis is pretty easy. So um, CLL cells have a characteristic appearance under the microscope. They are small um, lymphocytes with a rim of cytoplasm. Uh, the chromatin appears clumped um, and characteristically we see smear cells which are not pathognomonic of CLL but these cells have increased fragility as they're um, smeared to make the blood film and um, in addition to these small mature lymphocytes we also see the smear cells that you can see in the picture and the clonality and um, and characteristic immunophenotypes confirmed with um, flow cytometry. And it's just a characteristic plot. So um, normal B cells sit here with a high CD20 positivity. Um, and um, you can see that this population of CLL cells has a lower level of CD20 positivity and um, is expressing CD5 and 23 as well. We have um, two staging systems for CLL, the RAI and BNA staging systems. Um, I'm sure these are probably familiar to you. I won't go through them in any, um, any great detail. Uh, I think they're still helpful to um, identify patients with uh, disease that's of low burden and um, unlikely to cause an imminent problem. And there is uh, no doubt that in both staging system, as the stage increases, the volume and um, problems associated with CLL increase. So as the lymphocyte count increases, there's less space within the marrow to make the normal healthy blood cells and patients develop anemia and a low platelet count. And um, the majority of patients also have progressive involvement of different lymph node areas or, or as well as either or or as well as their sleep. So for patients with, um, with low risk CLL, well, with low stage CLL, for, for most people, the, um, the first, the majority of patients don't present with CLL that needs anything doing about it immediately. And then enter this period of what we call as, uh, as doctors watching and waiting, which is obviously um, often difficult for the patients. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second, but what are we watching and waiting for when we see those people? So in terms of the disease, everyone's going to have a, a full blood count before they see us so that we can watch the dynamics of their white cells to see um, if they're increasing or stable, because when you first meet people, you don't have a sense of whether they've had a high white count for a period of years or whether this is changing more quickly. Um, we would also look to see if they were developing anemia or thrombocytopenia. Um, Pre-COVID, we used to see everyone and examine them every time and assess for lymphadenopathy and spenomegaly. And obviously that's a little bit different now for some patients. Um, always important to uh, ask patients to keep an eye on their skin and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later and I think increasingly in the um, era of um, modern therapies for CLL I think it's important to keep one eye on the patient making sure they look after their other sort of comorbidities and risk factors 
And I think in the area of BTK inhibitors, particularly their sort of cardiac risk profile, so things like lipids and hypertension, it's probably important that, that people are aware that it's important to be on top of those things. I think it's as patients approach treatment, they, they will often lose some weight and start to develop sweats. And also that can be a feature of a change in the CLL that we'd be concerned about. Some patients are particularly concerned about the appearance of their nose, you know, especially in the neck and supraclavicular areas. And, you know, those nodes can be uncomfortable and unsightly and um, that, that can be an issue for some patients. And, you know, a really common symptom, which is always difficult to both tease out the, the etiology of and to know how best to advise to manage it is uh, fatigue. And I can certainly think of one uh, patient in recent years who, you know, after much discussion, I treated for a second time at a much earlier stage than I would have done normally because he had such significant fatigue that he knew would improve if, uh, if he restarted some treatment. Um, those are my kind of general thoughts on, you know, what we watch for, but obviously, ultimately, what we want to see is when we need to give some active treatment for the disease. So I think the key is to um, delay treatment as long as possible. CLL is a, a marathon of a disease rather than a sprint. We want to try and space out our therapies, especially in younger patients, so that we use them at the best time. So that the side effects are not, um, you know, experienced unnecessarily, and that we don't, you know, use things before we really need them. Um, and the absolute definition um, from the IWCLL guidelines is kind of progressive anemia or thrombocytopenia. Although, in fact, and there's a caveat for this in the guidelines, patients can have fairly stable um, mild to moderate anemia and thrombocytopenia for a period of time. So. You know, we see patients who progress and then hit a plateau that can sometimes last for years. The a definition of massive splenomegaly is made on clinical grounds as a treatment indication, and that's often associated with other problems such as thrombocytopenia. And uh, a massive nodal mass um, is also said to be an indication for treatment, although again, Patients can sometimes have pretty big, uh, particularly intra-abdominal masses that they're asymptomatic from and we can watch for a while. There's no doubt that um, a rapidly rising white cell count is a marker of CLL that's going to need to be treated. And um, it said that um, if uh, the, the, the way that we measure that is the, the period of time that it takes your lymphocyte count to double, so the lymphocyte doubling time. Um, and it's quite a useful marker to just keep an eye on uh, in patients, I think. Uh, and certainly if your um, lymphocyte count is doubling in six months or less, then um, if your lymphocyte count is low and you don't have any other associated cytopenias, it's not an indication to start treatment immediately. But it's when you can start to say to patients, I think, look, this disease is going to need some treatment and start hopefully over a period of appointments to discuss the treatment options and what we might do. Um, the good thing is that um, survival in CLL is um, improving. So uh, this is from, uh, I think, a Norwegian uh, population based study that was published recently. And you can see that um, both in younger and older patients over the last kind of 30 years or so, we can see an, uh, an incremental increase in the relative uh, survival of, the, of CLL patients compared to age matched uh, controls over time. And, and, you know, bear in mind, these are, um, data that don't take into account our new and incredibly effective drugs. So this curve is, um, you know, going to look dramatically different going forward. So I think it's helpful to be able to reassure your patients that 
even if they have CLL that needs treatment, we would hope that they live a long uh, life with of good quality. Um, we can uh, pick out things that we know um, mean the disease is likely to be more aggressive and active. Um, and uh, that includes a high staging, which was the um, historically the, the first way that we were able to pick out patients who might be more likely to leave therapy to need therapy. Uh, and before we had genetic tests and immunophenotyping, everyone um, had a bone marrow. And in patients who had um, you know, diffuse and generalized heavy marrow infiltration, then clearly they were at a higher risk of um, progressing. It's pretty well documented that if you are on watch and wait and your lymphocyte count is doubling every year, then again, that's marking you out as a patient who's more likely to need some treatment over time. Uh, we've already talked about immunoglobulin genes, and then there are some other genetic abnormalities that predict disease that's going to be um, busier and more likely to, to move. But we don't always, I'm sure Ben will talk about this, we don't always look for these genetic markers right at the beginning when we first diagnose people. Um, but I think particularly importantly, um, we all know that both deletions and mutations in the p53 gene historically have marked out CLL that's been very difficult to treat with chemoimmunotherapy but that thankfully has a much better response to the newer agents. There are psychological effects associated with the watch and wait process. Um, as doctors, we kind of think, well, you know, this is fine. We don't have to do anything. You can just kind of carry on as normal. But I asked some of my patients for some kind of quotes as to how they found that period. And um, interestingly, these are from some of my kind of most positive patients that that time of diagnosis and starting on your journey as a CLL patient is really quite a difficult time and to be told that you have a blood cancer but that we're not actually going to do anything about it it takes a bit of getting used to can we help with that i think practically it's really difficult to um in really crowded clinics to have full discussions but i think if you can try and make some extra time on a first or second appointment with new patients uh, on watch and wait. It's just really helpful to sit down and have a, a longer conversation and reassure people and go through some of the, the numbers and the graphs. And, you know, ideally our CNSs would be um, doing this too. It's really difficult again with the increased burden of sort of oral therapies now. Our CNSs are often tied up with delivering oral chemotherapy and, and venetoclax sort of ramp ups, but actually, you know, we mustn't lose sight of their importance as a, as a, a point of support. And I think, you know, this is where our local support groups and um, CLL support with online information, which is available on, on video and patient conferences, which are happen throughout the year are, are really fantastic sources of uh, information allowing our patients to become expert patients in their own CLL and I think it's really helpful to point patients in the direction of their local support group and the CLL support association in the UK and you know finally I just think I always say to people you know just time living with CLL for a bit getting used to the fact that you still feel okay um, is a you know a, a great way to kind of come to terms with where you are. There's lots of questions around watching where you know where do we do it? Do we do we do it in hospital? Um, do we do it in the community? I know certainly in in Oxford they have a system very well set up where patients are managed through their GPs and a specialist nurse monitors their bloods. Um, 
how often do we need to see people? Um, I think my practice is to kind of see people once every three or four months for the first year to get a feel for whether they have CLL that's progressing and then um, increase the interval between visits after that um, to six monthly or sometimes annually. And in patients with a lymphocyte count that's at a, a modest level and, and really stable, we discharge back to the GP to re-refer if there's any change. I think, you know, one of the, the questions that I get asked most often by patients is, you know, is there anything that I can do to um, slow the progression of my CLL or make it less likely to, um, to change? And um, I, I tend to, I mean, there's historical evidence about green tea extracts and tablets and some, um, you know, I often mention the fact that in follicular lymphoma, there's some soft evidence that having a healthy vitamin D level um, can fit with a group that are less likely to have progressive disease. There's no direct evidence of that in CLL, but sometimes I think it's great as a patient if there's just something that you feel you can do yourself in terms of, you know, eating a bit more yogurt or having some green tea capsules. I think it's empowering you to try and have some control over what's happening to you as a patient. And obviously um, education we've talked about already and, and kind of educating patients and ourselves about looking after the other issues that their CLL can, can cause. So um, we talked, just mentioned recurrent infections. So one of the biggest issues for CLL patients and probably one of the ways that we can make the biggest difference uh, as as CLL physicians is being aware of the immune dysfunction in CLL. So this is multifactorial. It's not just to do with the B cell. There is significant T cell dysfunction and um, abnormalities in the T cell subset. Uh, I'm not an immunologist, so I won't go into this in any, any huge detail, but there's also defects in our monocytes and macrophages in CLL that impairs our neutral function and our ability to uh, deal particularly with capsulate bacteria and often sometimes abnormalities in complement as well. Um, so in, infections are a problem um, for, for some CLL patients. Um, you know, we have more effective drugs now, but some of those are continuous and it's clear that even though they're great for CLL, um, you know, infections can still be an issue. And as patients live longer with their CLL on medication, they have more time to acquire problems. And that, they, you know, bacterial infection in CLL um, carries, uh, you know, a significant risk. So this is a Danish study where they looked at 317 bacteremias in CLL patients, and they had a 28% mortality at 30 days. So one of the ways that we can help to mitigate against that is to vaccinate patients. And I think it's really important to do this um, when patients are first diagnosed, when you first see them. Um, don't delay until they're due to start some chemotherapy. And it's clear now from our COVID vaccine studies that at that point, our response to vaccination is, is probably really um, already attenuated. Um, I'll go through this in a bit more detail, but we will see vaccines against flu, COVID and pneumococcus, and um, don't use live vaccinations. Uh, and we also have other alternatives in those who um, are having recurrent infections. So we have recently published our new CLL guidelines uh, and the recommendations are there, which I'll just go through very quickly. So seasonal flu vaccine annually and should also be administered to household members. And uh, young children receive a live flu vaccine and the recommendation is that patients should try and stay out of their way for a week or so. Easier said than done if you live with small children. And I'm not sure I've ever seen anyone who's acquired flu from a live vaccine. Uh, <coughs> pneumococcus is very important. And the uh, important thing there is that patients receive um, both Pneumovax 
and the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, which is normally given to children. So um, we know that NCLL patients respond pretty well, well, better to that, um, but both should be given. The polysaccharide vaccine needs to be repeated every five years. And if you've got a patient with recurrent infections, it's useful to check their functional antibody levels six weeks after that vaccination, um, because that helps access the immunoglobulin if needed. Um, so you may well have long-standing patients in your clinic who are, um, you know, have been having their pneumovax every five years. It's important to make sure that they have the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine as well. So no live retinitis viruses, and now shingles, we're lucky to have um, an inactivated shingles vaccine called Shingrix, which is given at the appropriate time by the GPs. So COVID, we all know that our CLL patients had um, a huge um, issue uh, with COVID in the initial stages of the pandemic. And um, that is for patients who are treated and untreated. We know that CLL patients should have three doses as their primary vaccination course, and then regular boosters thereafter. So patients are having now their fifth dose in all if they started at the beginning of the pandemic. But newly diagnosed patients or patients who haven't previously been vaccinated need to have three doses and then boosters given at least three months apart. And ideally, household contacts should be vaccinated to the same schedule. Um, again, in the UK, we've got fantastic data from Helen Parry and her group in Birmingham with Paul Moss. And... Um, they have followed a large group of CLL patients through their vaccination journey during the pandemic. Um, this uh, sort of visual shows you uh, the number of patients, the percentage of CLL patients who are seroconverting to COVID with subsequent um, booster doses. So you can see that um, there is a, an increase in patients who are seroconverting between dose two and dose three, but dose three to four, there's no further increase. So you're left with this sort of 20% of patients who have not responded. And interestingly, those patients don't appear to respond to natural infections either. If you've already got a low serum IgM or you're on a BTK inhibitor, or you're just about to start treatment, you're much more likely to, to fall into that group. And then we can look at the vaccine response in two ways. One is the antibody levels, and the second is the cellular or sort of T cell responses. And what we can see is that for those patients who respond to the vaccine, after three doses, of uh, the vaccine, they have an equivalent antibody response to healthy controls who've had two. And it doesn't matter um, whether you have identical vaccine for all three doses or heterologous vaccine. So three doses in CLL kind of is equivalent to two doses in the healthy controls. That's for patients who do respond. T cell responses are actually comparable in CLL patients after the second vaccine. But if it's not so good, interestingly, in this situation, your T cell response may increase if you give a heterologous third dose. This, these are small numbers and not, this is from a, a recent study and this isn't kind of recommended treatment yet. Um, and this is just how vaccination kind of has performed in the, the almost 500 patients that um, Helen has followed. And you can see that um, the different colours of the bars on the graph represent the different waves of, of, of COVID. So this is the Alpha, Delta and Omicron, all since vaccination started. Um, and the black line is um, the uh, hospitalizations. So um, as you can see, low numbers of um, these are actual breakthrough infections in CLL patients. So low numbers of infections early when people are shielding. 
um, but still high, um, high levels of hospitalization. But at the beginning of this year, um, lots and lots of uh, COVID infections, which is reflected in my practice, um, but um, very few hospitalizations. And demographically, this represents a younger patient group. And importantly, in this vaccinated uh, population of patients who contracted COVID, there were no deaths. So that's, you know, that is the, the selling point for vaccination for our CLL patients. It's incredibly important when you see patients on watch and wait to check that they're up to date with vaccination. And certainly that's what I've seen, you know, since about February time, I've had multiple patients contract COVID and um, really very few needed to come into hospital, which is great. Um, I, it's important to check as well that patients know what they need to do. So I put a little footer on my letters. Um, you need to have some NHS issued lateral flow tests at home. And if that's positive and you love the result, hopefully someone should call you within 24 hours to assess you for your antivirals. My experience, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. So in practice, we um, tell our patients to also either contact their GP or our CNS who can start the ball rolling in terms of accessing antivirals. And obviously in the pipeline, which is now licensed, but we can't yet use it. So there was 20% of patients who haven't responded to the vaccine. You know, are we gonna be able to use prophylactic monoclonal antibodies to um, minimize their risk of COVID going forward? Um, in terms of infections, um, we should consider antibacterials for all patients with a history of recurrent um, infections. Um, PCP, these are again from the guidelines. PCP treatment is controversial on the, on the new medications. I think there's, it's fair to say when we last discussed it, there's no consensus within the CLL forum as to what everyone's doing. And I think in general, patients with disease that's being treated for a second or subsequent time have a higher risk of opportunistic infections. Um, and all these things are reported rarely on the new drugs. Um, so um, the guidelines have suggested um, some durations for the various settings in the new drugs, which I've tabulated there. It is also difficult to use with the new drugs because of interactions. So if you have a patient who has a history of significant fungal infection and needs treated, best to liaise with your microbiology team. Immunoglobulin replacement, we'll all be aware of. Um, that I'm running out of time. I think that's George coming up to, uh, to speak. I'll whiz through what I've got. So very well-defined criteria now for, um, for who receives immunoglobulin because of the shortages. And it's probably better to try and give it subcutaneously. Um, we've got autoimmune complications in terms of autoimmune hemolytic anemia which uh, are contributed to in, probably by the T-cell abnormalities in CLL. Um, not always easy to diagnose as marrow infiltration can influence the retic kind and the, and the blood counts in other ways. And a piece of CLL history is that, you know, CL single agent fladarabin was a big cause of autoimmune hemolytic anemia in um, certainly in the CLL4 trial. Uh, treatment is similar to um, other autoimmune hemolytic anemias, and I think the the if if your autoimmune condition repeatedly relapses when you're weaning immunosuppression, then um, you need to consider treating the CLL itself. Do ITP. So second cancers in CLL, probably the most important one is to get people to keep an eye on their skin. So SCCs are incredibly common. Um, particularly in sun exposed areas. So non-healing spots need to go to dermatology. Melanomas and other cancers are also more common. And then very quickly at the end, just talk about high grade transformation of CLL. So a proportion of patients go on to have a much uh, more aggressive um, high grade lymphoma. Uh, the majority of these are diffuse large B cell lymphoma. The majority are clonally related to the underlying CLL and patients present with different symptoms. 
the pets really useful to look for a site that's more active and um, treatments really difficult. Uh, and a shout out for uh, Toby's um, stellar trial, which is using um, a BTK inhibitor in combination with CHOP and various different platforms, the best option. So um, this is a um, final quote from one of my patients um, on his CLL journey. So his main goal was to see Brighton play in the Premiership and uh, they've been there for five seasons. And for him, he says CLL stands for come on, live life. So thank you very much. Ros, that was fantastic. What a wonderful way to end. Come on, live life. I do like that. Thank you. Um, so just to remind everybody, questions in the Q&A. Um, there are so many areas that I'm wanting to dip into. Um, things like watch and wait and fatigue and negotiating start points. It's going to be very good to get John's opinion on this. I'm just going to very quickly dip into one. Right at the beginning, you'd mentioned family history, a recurrent theme. And I think the registrars in the listing today will start to come across this. Should we test my family members? Um, I tend to say no. Uh, our standard patients are 60, 78 years old. They want to say, should they be testing their children? They've looked up online that there is this increased instance of, well, all B lymphoblasts and first degree relatives. Do you, do you have a, a stock phrase for that, Ros? Do you handle it in a specific way? Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to underplay it too, George, because I'm not sure it's helpful. Um, I say, you know, there are, you know, if you look up, there's a definite family association in, 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 in some cases, but, but in practice, it's not something that is a, a definite, and it's not that you will definitely pa pass this on to your family members. And um, I think it's, it's interesting uh, biologically and genetically more than it is an absolute risk for the patient's families. Yes, because I come up with some hand-waving thing that if there's a lifetime risk of CLL is one in 10,000, and if your first degree relative is four times higher risk, that means one in two and a half thousand. So there's a 2,499 yeah. chance that out of 2,500, they won't get it. To so try and sort of simplify with slightly made up statistics, but it's a, a way to phrase it. Do you have anything, Pierce? Do you address that head on or is it something you just try to not to get involved with? Yeah, I historically not got involved. I've, um, yeah, you said there's a small tendency, as indeed with all, um, uh, you know, malignancies in this way, but I, I don't recommend testing. I, um, I don't stop people going off from getting a blood count, I guess, but I don't encourage it. Yeah. And John, sorry, I don't want to start prying into your personal case too much, but is that something that you saw as a priority? Is it something as a patient that matters to you? Possibly and usually by virtue of the fact that I was aged 32 when I was uh, diagnosed and we didn't have children. So it was a question I asked with regard to the risks if we went on to have children. Hmm. Uh, I was told there wasn't similar numbers, as I recall, to what you just uh, mentioned. And as a result, we, we then proceeded to have children. Hmm. But uh, given the, the, the average age of diagnosis is, is a lot older than that that's probably not representative but it's it's a case in fact yeah okay L let's move on to some of the meaty things there so watch and wait it is interesting Ros. you're giving a couple of those really quite upsetting quotes in a way um I'm, i must i i have my standard thing i say to patients no matter how you how pragmatic you are and what type of thinker you are it takes at least four months to get your head around this concept that you actually have something wrong with you that we cannot cure and this concept of a chronic disorder that might not be making you ill at the moment but is something that's hanging over you slightly is of course very challenging and i was quite interested in your strategy of repeated visits. And I must admit, I've developed, I think more so over the COVID pandemic, of shorter clinics, seeing someone, talking to them for a relatively short period, then they spend a bit of time with the nurses, and then I bring them back in two or three weeks. Because 
a sort of a double hit rather than a sitting with someone for 40, 45 minutes when you see them glazing over. I don't know, Ros, what, what are your thoughts? On that? Yeah, no, I think there's just such a lot of information to take on board. It's a whole new language for patients. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, they need, they need time to do their, it's, it's a journey to being an expert patient. It takes, you have to do your background, re you know, for the majority of patients, they want to know about what's happening to them. Um, you know, they want to go home and read the booklets and look at the websites and generate their own questions. So, you know, I always say write down the things that you want to ask when you come back. Um, I tend to get my um, CNS to call the patients actually before I see them if they've been diagnosed somewhere else. So that they've had a chat with her and some booklets before they come to their first appointment. But I think you can just, if you just give them, it's so hard in clinic, isn't it? But if you can give people just a little bit of extra time right at the beginning, I think you can just make things a lot easier for a lot of, I mean, there are always people who are really anxious, but I think yeah. just giving people time and really sort of trying to, um, you know, explain in the way that they need to hear it, what's going to happen can make, you know, a big difference. But I think I totally agree with you as well, that, that I always say to patients, the best thing that's going to help is time. You know, you, you you get used to the fact, oh, yeah, I've had this now for a year and I'm still all right. And, and, and know, then the actually the pudding is in the eating, whatever we say. And then you do get patients who then flip the other way, don't they? And they're very reluctant to consider treatment, even when <laughs> the clinician are trying to push it. But, John, let's sorry, I'm going to dip straight to you, John, on that point, because watch and wait. Is, is It is unusual as a cancer, isn't it, to be told we're doing nothing in effect. Give me your feedback. It's absolutely counterintuitive. You know, you've got cancer, we're going to do nothing about it. You know, it's, it's panic mode from, from a patient's perspective. And it's all very well to say that a, 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 an informed patient has a better outcome. But at that point in their, in their whole story, they are totally uninformed. And, and it's that point that I believe the, the more information that a patient has, uh, reliable information the patient has access to, the better. Unfortunately, Dr. Google is not the place to go. And it's the, it's the almost instant reaction. Uh, and that's where the likes of CLS support, Maggie centers, you know, if you can send a person down to a Maggie center on hearing their initial diagnosis, that's probably where they have the time to be able to tell them about this. Yeah. No, there's a uh, forgive me for interrupting, George. This is Lewis. Um, the, the other thing that I would say is if you are able to take somebody into a cons consultation with you, your partner, your wife, uh, in my case, they hear a different message. Oh, definitely. definitely. And, and those two messages come together. And that I found that's helped me enormously as a patient. Thank you, Lewis. I, I think that's a very clear message as well multiple sets of ears are better than one set of ears because so much washes over people. I think because we've got so we've got questions coming up in the chat, which I'm just going to keep moving. I think the other point, I think becoming an expert patient, can I just put a little bit of caution for the registrars who are listening? Not every patient wants to be an expert. And I genuinely say I, I've just Obviously, I've been running our CLL clinic for 17 years now, so you get used to these sort of stock phrases. I say some people want to become an expert and they manage their CLL well by learning everything about it. We see some patients at our conferences. Other patients decide that my name is John. I'm an engineer from Kings Lynn and I am not a CLL. I don't want to engage in CLL. That's why I come to your clinic. And both approaches are completely fine. So I, I think the expert approach a patient is great but I think registrars listening please don't feel you've got to force that on somebody saying look you've got to read this etc etc I know that's obvious um Piers any comments on that and Ben I'm leaving you out because you're not on video so I don't know whether you're engaged so Piers any comments on that before we go to the Q&A from the George, floor? thank you I'm I'm definitely engaged and I'm listening ah. absolutely fascinated to this oh uh, Ben I'm not on video because I can't start the video myself so um, oh. they, our, our, our hosts have um, here we ah. go. So look at that, Ben. Your it, word yeah. is their command. <laughs> ben, command. So, tell me. So comments um, on what you've heard so far. I'm, so I'm being invited in. Uh, so I, I think we mustn't forget also that we have ears too, and and we kind of need to go into a listening mode. So it's not about a one-way stream of information. And I hear what John says about you know information is empowering, and and I think. You know that's that's absolutely axiomatic. 
But when we're listening and we're, we're sitting down and working out this relationship, that's something that we build up over time, whether we build it into bite-sized chunks or in, in a longer conversation. And, and I think that one of the values of a longer conversation is building in pauses so that you can get that feedback and, and maybe tailor the consultation um, in, into, into that. Um, so I, I, that, that was a, a quick, quick point. No, no, and I think that really illustrates, I'll bring peers in on the relationship with patients because let's all be clear, start a good CLL clinic, most CLL patients, it's not an emergency to start treatment, it's a negotiated start point. And we build these relationships, don't we? And particularly things like fatigue, things like uh, is lymphadenopathy troublesome? You know, this is a multiple clinic visit. And I must admit, I found with the arrival of the novel therapies, with the ability to treat someone with perhaps things that aren't going to knock them flat in the same way FCR did, it's also changed our thresholds for starting treatment. We, we all must be aware of that in the clinics. And, and the only way that we can get to the right point is negotiating. Piers, let me bring you in. Yeah, well, I, no, I, I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think it is a relationship and that comes with time. And I think going to the, I mean, the trainees on the call and everything else, it's going to the clinic and actually probably not seeing these patients on your own, but seeing them with someone who's sort of navigated this before is probably uh, very helpful because, yeah, I mean, it's multiple visits with me. Um, like Rod says, it. I mean, I'm, I'm very... Um, I, I'm, I'm pretty conservative when it comes to starting treatment. Um, I'm, I'm often focusing on, are, is the symptoms that the patient's exhibiting with me the, really due to their disease? Am I going to make a difference with the treatment? Am I just going to induce side effects? So actually, just to answer that quick question about the doubling count, that in the, in the chat. Yes, I was about to bring you in specifically on that yes. because it relates to what you're saying. Um, that's a classic example of where actually I, I, often I'm seeing patients without their blood. I'm not that bothered about seeing their blood tests in the clinic. I'm much more bothered about seeing them. And so patients are sometimes a bit surprised if I don't actually have the blood test there and then. I say, well, well you know, but, but actually it, it, by taking the patient rather than the, the blood parameters into account is, is nearly always how I judge it. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 um, Clearly, we have to operate within the framework of the IWCLL guidelines, but it is, it's a framework. Not a I, I'm going to link on that, and Ros, I can see you're going to comment. I think just, just to answer that, it's a good question from the registrar. So remember the IWCLL treatment indications, they're as much driven to harmonise clinical trial entry. Uh, I think we do have to be honest with that. And you'll find that particularly patients who be managing CLL consultants have been managing CLL for a long time, do often, exactly as Piers has just talked about, get ever more, um, not, not, not careful, but we, we just don't rush into making treatment decisions. We've all got patients in our clinic with big spleens, thrombocytopenia, white counts of 150, but they've got mutated IGHV, and they're just not changing that quickly, and they're enjoying a good quality of life. And all of those things we used to say when we were younger docs, you know, technology is going to change, everything's going to be better, is now actually coming true. And the longer cans have been kicked down the road, the better our technological advances. And it really is impacting on how we're managing our patients. Roz, sorry, you were about to comment. No, I was just going to say, I think probably the lymphocyte doubling time changes more of my conversations with the patient, the, the tone of the conversation than what I actually do. So, you know, this, this is looking like your CLL is going to need treated at some point if it keeps going at this at this pace rather than an absolute uh, line in the sand. And then you can, you know, I think as well, starting to talk early about therapies and options and, you know, point, pointing people in the directions of, of what, what, you know, particularly the, the sort of patients who've got a, a choice up front now um, of two very good treatments, uh, but very different treatments. Um, I think you can start that conversation earlier, can't you? And then it'll probably all have changed by the time they get to treatment because they'll plateau and, um, yeah, won't, won't need any treatment at the time you thought they would. But I think it's um, it, it's just a sort of uh, real-world observation of the dynamics of their disease. 
Yeah, no, no, which can help guide us. Now, because the next question in the chat, and do please put questions in this chat, is about mm -hmm. the autoimmune complications. And I must admit, I do remember as a new consultant agonizing a lot about these that you sort of feel forced to treat the CLL and I remember Claire from the Marsden very wise Claire did and telling me you know George try and separate the two if they become unstable from an autoimmune perspective treat it try and stick with steroids rituximab if you have to but keep the CLL treatment to one side um, and I've kept that basic principle of practice with me you do get the occasional patient where that doesn't quite work out and you do have to end up treating the CLL. Ben, what's your take on autoimmune complications? Make sure I'm not a, yeah, I, th I think that's very much the approach. Look, if somebody becomes um, you know, anemic because of autoimmune hemolysis, but is otherwise well with low burden of disease, then this is something that can, you know, it might be a, a, a marker of more active disease, but quite often it isn't. And you can have somebody where you, you wean down the steroid and, and eventually get them off or add in a steroid sparing agent. And you don't need to touch the CLL at all for, for, for years. So I think separating them out, as you say, has been a point of wisdom. And, uh, and I'm always happy to receive that. <laughs> now we have got a couple more minutes because i know we said we're going to have 15 minutes break but because there was a bit of a long intro we're going to have about seven minutes break we can't finish without ros covering off your bit on covid because covid is such a big issue for the patients in the clinic uh how we manage our clinics and you did put that last uh, slide on Evusheld. So I was able to catch up with AZ last week and get an update. So of course, as you know, we still do not have access in the UK. Uh, those negotiations are ongoing. Um, we are aware in, in my non-NHS practice, I have patients who are international who have had Evusheld. Um, people are getting access across the world and it is a sore point, I think, particularly for CLL, which of all our lymphoproliferative disorders is probably the one where we would be wanting Evershield. Um, so I think if there are any take home messages at the moment with COVID, uh, Roz, do you want to give us your snapshot? You, you gave us quite an upbeat that people aren't in hospital. Have we felt with these latest Omicron variants that's just firmed up a just got a little bit more cautious or are you still relatively relaxed? I mean, I think um, it's, I mean, I think we're, you know, that theatre is fantastic. You know, we've, we're really lucky in the UK to have that information. I think we are all probably pleasantly surprised that if you respond, you respond pretty well. Um, and my experience in recent months you know, so what I say is, you know, in recent months, this has been dramatically different. You know, people in their 80s on venetoclax have kind of had a mild illness with COVID. Um, but we just don't know what is going to happen over the next few weeks, probably. I mean, my sense is that this, this in, in friends seems like perhaps a, a, a slightly more sort of clinically significant illness, but... I, I think we've just got to be careful. You know, you, you, I think it's, it's reassuring for patients that the risks associated with being out and about are clearly significantly less with vaccination and antivirals. So vaccinations and, and then follow up the NHS, that helpline, the 119, and then call your clinics if there are patients listening. But I'm just, I know we're running out of time, but Mark, so, so J John is our patient rep on the panel, but Mark, who's in the background, is our CLL, very experienced CLL patient, just popped on his video there and he popped off because, Mark, you did want to just remind a point to us all, didn't you, about how this virus can just hang around so long in CLL patients? Yes, if there are patients on the line, be assured, uh, as you said, take take uh, 111, take the advice there. Be persistent sometimes with 111. They are a bit stretched and sometimes the message is confused. But if you are that bad, go speak to your specialist. I had Paxlovid uh, two weeks ago. We thought it cleared it and then it came back after two days. Uh, so for people who are on, as I was, I brewed to nearby, I had to suspend while I was on Paxlovid, I'm now back on Ibrutinib. I hope it's the right thing to do, but it's still hanging around. But uh, I, I'm managing, um, uh, I'm, I'm not bedridden, 
So you've just got to be patient and hopefully it will 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 um, clear in the end. We've certainly got members that have said it's lasted for weeks for some of them. So you've got to do something that's not natural to me and that's be patient. Oh dear, Mark, I'm sorry. I think you you raised this point about stopping BTK inhibitors when people are actually suffering from COVID. And I think there's been a general consensus across CLL docs in the UK, not backed up firmly by evidence, but I know in our practice, that's what we do. And Piers has raised his hand. Can I just make a point? We don't know what to do. So we have actually got an NIHR funded study, yeah. which will run in the autumn to try and explore this question about whether we should or shouldn't stop VTKI, just to plug that. So um, it's something we're actively thinking about, and there is, a, there is going to be a study to look at this. And just a very final linking point, just to flag, there's a, a study from general practice looking at suspension of methotrexate yeah, pre well, post-vaccination, and quite interesting, wasn't it? You got a clearly yeah. better vaccination response if you stop. So, so actually, this study is mirrored, is, a, is actually designed around exactly the same principles as that study, and we used that as a template for the proposal and what the protocol is going to be. Yeah. So we we don't, but we don't know. So I think the study is valid. Perfect. Right, everyone. So we've covered off the questions in the Q and A. Um, so if there are no more discussion points from the floor, I would like to thank Ros very much and the panel.